as moderator this morning, my role is to be a gatekeeper, which is uh, an important uh, uh, appellation for this morning's discussion. Because what I would like to discuss is how science is to be effectively used in the civil justice system. And in that discussion, would like to address both the Daubert case and other alternative ways in which science uh, can be used effectively, fairly, and justly uh, in the civil justice system. Uh, I intend to spend as little of the 10 minutes I've been allotted as possible. Uh, and I would hope that each of our six panel members will spend as little of his or her three to five minutes uh, as possible so that we can have a lively uh, discussion about these issues. Uh, let me begin by saying that about a year after the Daubert decision was handed down, I wrote a short uh, article uh, on the case and emphasized uh, its breadth uh, and its evident purpose uh, from Justice Blackmun's decision. And that evident purpose is for the federal courts, particularly the trial courts, uh, to play a gatekeeper role with respect to the use of science uh, in the courtroom uh, in the kinds of cases we've been talking about here today. Uh, three years of appellate decisions uh, after Dalbert, I think on balance, have uh, demonstrated that the courts are following that lead. Uh, in the Daubert case itself on remand, uh, Judge Kaczynski uh, criticized, evaluated uh, the plaintiff's uh, experts in terms of whether or not they constituted scientific evidence uh, under the court's definition, and then found that the evidence which they did proffer would not fit, was not relevant. And hence, he affirmed the summary judgment uh, of the trial court originally. <clears throat> but other courts uh, have uh, read the decision much less broadly, uh, particularly, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, can I get some water? particularly Judge Barquette, Eleventh Circuit, has said that the decision does not stand uh, for anything of the sort. It intends instead to be a loosening of the rules on scientific evidence in the courtroom. Now, in preparation uh, today, I went back and read an obscure uh, article written by a uh, uh, practitioner from Albany, New York, in 1900. Uh, and that practitioner uh, published his piece in the Albany Medical Annals. And then it was republished in the Harvard Law Review. And that author's name was Billings, a learned hand. And Judge Hand had a different conception entirely of what uh, ought to be done. His view was that the expert represented an exception and an unwarranted exception to the general rule that witnesses should not be able to testify about the ultimate issues in the case. A murderer cannot be convicted by witnesses who testify, yes, the defendant intended to kill the victim. Uh, but experts are an exception. And, and then practitioner, but future Judge Hand, uh, concluded that there was no warrant for this exception. His view instead was that so the jury is, to be sure, incapable of calling upon its general bank of experience to resolve scientific questions, but just
for the same, very same set of reasons, the jury was incapable of resolving the competing testimony of scientific experts, which even 100 years ago had become the norm in many, many cases. What he advocated instead, and really when you think about it, it is conceptually a, an entirely different line uh, from the Fry through Dalbert line, uh, was that the scientific questions be presented to a scientific panel. And then the scientific panel would present their ultimate conclusions on the general issues, the questions which are outside the uh, capability of general jurors in society. And those resolutions of general questions would then be given to the jury as authoritative uh, determinations of general principle uh, on matters of science. And they could be overturned by the jury if and only if a reasonable jury under all the circumstances would reasonably conclude that there was a basis for rejecting them. Uh, he envisioned the role of the trial judge under that circumstance of overseeing the jury's acceptance or rejection of those general principles and their use of those general principles in the resolution of the causation issues. So recapitulating and to try to give some focus to this morning's discussion, a hundred years ago, Judge Hand was saying, as a practicing lawyer, we've gone down the wrong road. The road we've gone down is to try to differentiate uh, among those uh, types of scientific testimony which we will allow to be presented to the jury and those types which we will not. And that fundamentally that rests upon uh, an exception to the general prohibition against opinion testimony which is logically unwarranted and which has all kinds of practical consequences which he considered untoward. That counsel was rejected. Uh, we've gone down the road with Dalbert and Fry. Uh, but today, uh, I want to pose the question of whether Judge Hand wasn't right all along and isn't the better approach uh, to be thinking in terms of independent scientific evaluation of key questions with that advice presented as general propositions, which the jury would then consider in a matter which is analogous to the judge's charge, although the judge's charge would be conclusive on the jury, whereas the scientific uh, judgments would be only presumptive or advisory. Now, um, this obviously poses uh, important questions. Are there independent scientific uh, experts out there? Are there unbiased uh, independent scientific experts? Or is science simply as politicized as everything else in our society today? Finding those experts if they exist. And is there a mechanism that could be suggested which is other than simply a judge calling up his uh, cronies or people from his university or someplace else and saying, who do you suggest so that the process has an informality which provides no guarantee of uh, fairness, openness, and all the other considerations which uh, we would think uh, we would want to have. And lastly, is it possible because the trial judges themselves are so politicized? Do we have a, a bench which is capable of uh, turning these issues over to a scientific panel if it's objective and finding an objective panel and then following through along the lines that Judge uh, Hand uh, uh, suggested. Now, uh, this morning we have uh, six panelists and with the exception of Peter Huber and Mr. Nace, uh, uh, they are non-lawyers and they can speak to the scientific questions here. And coincidentally, perhaps, all four know a fair amount about the breast implant uh, litigation. Uh, so I suspect we're going to hear, and I'd like to have addressed to, to the extent possible, uh, some of these questions in the context of that litigation. Let me say that I do so with two caveats. Number one, I want to make clear at the outset that my law firm, not me, but my law firm, 
uh, is significantly involved uh, in the breast implant litigation. And secondly, uh, I think many in this room know that some of the issues that I've suggested here are issues which are live today in the context of that litigation. Uh, and I don't want my remarks to be interpreted as either uh, a, an endorsement of the general concept or a criticism of the general context concept in the context of that particular litigation. I think the questions which I posed about, are there independent scientists, how do we find them, and are, can judges be trusted uh, to establish a process uh, which itself is unbiased or all legitimate questions in the context of that litigation. Uh, so if I now can turn to our first speaker, now let me introduce them all just generally so you'll know uh, their relationship and the order in which they will appear. Uh, first, we have uh, Barry Nace, who is a well-known uh, plaintiff's attorney. He was, as I understand it, a former president of the American uh, Trial Lawyers and uh, he has been involved in many of the controversial tort uh, issues of the day, so he can uh, present uh, a general reaction, I would hope, to some of the things that I've had to say and uh, uh, address how he thinks, if there are other alternatives than the two general lines that I've laid out for how scientific issues might be resolved uh, in the context of civil litigation. Then we will hear from uh, Dr. George Ehrlich, who uh, uh, is uh, was chairman of the Arthritis Advisory Committee of the FDA and an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Uh, he is uh, a thoughtful critic of the process of science in the courts, and in particular is, I think, uh, prepared to speak to the difficulty which not just jurors but even judges have dealing with uh, uh, statistics and questions where numeracy or an ability to deal with uh, uh, numbers uh, is at issue. Uh, then we have Dr. Norman uh, Anderson of the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Dr. Anderson uh, will speak, as I understand it, to the uh, role in which the regulatory process and the role in which regulated companies in that process uh, uh, tend to play and the interaction between the regulatory process uh, and the uh, and the civil justice system. And, and uh, then we have Dr. Uh, Stuart Slossman, who is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, professor Slossman is uh, responsible for having developed a number of the assays used uh, to test for immune system depression and uh, he has is a, a a critic and thoughtful about how those assays or alternatives to them have been used uh, in the court system and then we have uh, Gina Collada uh, who is a science and medical reporter uh, for the New York Times and uh, she has written uh, fairly extensively about breast implant issues and I would uh, this is one uh, uh, of our panelists that I would like to think a little beyond breast implant, although she's very knowledgeable about that, because I think many of us on both sides, plaintiffs and defense side of, of these issues, recognize that uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle certainly applies to the press. Uh, they are not uh, a, a, an observer uh, whose actions uh, do not affect the process. They are very much involved and uh, uh, <laughs> And I would like her to, to think about and comment about the press's special responsibility uh, in this area. Lastly, uh, the person at my left here, Peter Huber, needs no introduction uh, at all. Uh, as you all know, he is... Uh, <laughs> he would deny that. But, but Peter has written extensively in a whole variety of areas. I guess I would think of Peter as, as more than a, uh, an expert in this area, but indeed uh, perhaps the leading commentator uh, nationwide today on, the on, on really technical and scientific issues as they relate to the judicial system. And he's peripatetic enough that uh, he turns from one topic to another uh, with great aplomb and uh, uh, needs uh, no uh, introduction from me, but I'm sure Peter will have many views on all the subjects 
uh, that uh, I brought up and the, the uh, um, issues presented uh, by the others on the panel. So with so further introduction, I will turn it over to Mr. Lefnix. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I guess I should say it's nice to be here with a, a group that uh, most of my friends would uh, refer to as a right-wing radical group. Um, and also, when I was asked to be on this uh, panel, I thought, well, what do I want to go to that group for? I mean, but then I realized it's not too often that I get a chance to get on a panel with someone who's written about me and said I was a Simon and a poet of the Bendecton litigation, and uh, who uh, wrote about my cases, but never consulted me about my cases, uh, and who quoted me only partially. So I thought that's a good reason to go onto the panel. And I was also thinking, uh, <laughs> gee, this, this organization also has somebody in it uh, who's, a, who's a judge uh, here in town, who once said to me, uh, gee, Barry, I." I had to uh, JNOB that case because you just tried a better case than the other guy. But that's that sounds fair. And uh, you know, another member of this organization has uh, criticized me and and uh, the Bendecton litigation and even uh, the Supreme Court. And uh, never had one of the cases. He was a judge. And then there was uh, an organization that I look at. And I think most of my colleagues look at it as one that is dedicated to uh, eliminating jury trials for individuals uh, and making life as difficult as possible for plaintiffs and their attorneys to ever succeed. An organization that I think uh, mostly uh, fears, uh, fears juries. I don't know, gee, this is also an opportunity to speak in front of a group that's very unusual for me to speak in front of a group that doesn't represent people uh, from time to time. You know? And uh, as you can imagine, this is kind of a unique experience for me. And as I thought about it, maybe I would rather be in Philadelphia. I don't know. Uh, I'm a graduate of a law school in Pennsylvania, uh, Dickinson. And uh, I also have a, a degree in chemistry. And that's uh, sort of how I got into this area. But uh, long before I got involved in, in this subject, I was just trying cases here in Washington, D.C., in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, as a personal injury attorney. Um, although when you read about me, you would think that I've got this huge law firm and I've been doing all these huge things for all these years. Uh, my law firm has five people in it, probably smaller than most of yours. Um, and as for this topic, I was told that the topic today was supposed to be science and, and civil justice. Let me start out by saying that in the last few years, I have seen little of civil justice when science is involved. Uh, I have witnessed and I have seen people that would get up and put things in briefs and argue things and, and write things about such subjects as epidemiology and confidence intervals and quote proof and quote and quote no evidence and quote and absolutely do it wrong and know that they're doing it wrong. I have seen this phrase, a very tricky phrase, junk science, that was coined somewhere along the line, be turned into what somebody else has called junk scholarship. I have seen scientists in my career that have been working with the drug companies and who write articles, and this is something for the scientists here to think about, who write articles because they're asked to, which are even approved by drug companies before they get printed. I've seen judges, and for you judges that are here, it's my opportunity. I'm just amazed when I see some of these opinions that have been written, such as the second one, the, the Daubert decision that was referred to. I was involved in that case. I don't have any idea where those facts in that opinion came from. So, you know, I wonder what's going on here. And I have to admit, I have to admit that in my stronger moments, I really wonder how some people can sleep out there. And in my weaker moments, I say, geez, I wish it would happen to them. Uh, but uh, it doesn't. So as far as this, this science and civil justice, 
it's, I think we're in a situation right now where anything goes. Anything goes as far as the end of winning is met. Was Judge Hand wrong? Well, if you think that juries and people are stupid, no, he wasn't wrong. We shouldn't let things like this for juries. They're just not smart enough if that's what you believe. But for those of us who actually go into courtrooms and try cases and actually get down there in the pits and deal with people, Judge Han was wrong. Just as those judges are wrong who want to decide that a case cannot get to a jury because they have to decide whether or not the conclusion is right in a violation of what the Daubert case held, which was, which nobody ever contested, <coughs> by the way, that the judge should be allowed to decide whether or not there is methodology. I just argued a case yesterday in a court of appeals in which if you follow Judge Hand's reasoning, I suppose, on this, this is what happened below. Been around only for 12 years now. 12 years in front of the same judge, two summary judgment motions. Obviously, the first one was unsuccessful, or there wouldn't have been a second. But after the first one, the plaintiff was asked to expand their affidavit. So they did. The plaintiff had affidavits that were very thick and attached articles, uh, two experts. One had an article, 114 articles. One had 77 articles. Defendant filed nothing in response from any expert. Then the plaintiff was asked to bring, uh, to bring their experts into town for the Daubert hearing. But before that happened, after it was postponed three times by the judge on the day of hearing with the experts in town, the judge decided, no, we ought to have this prepared, something prepared by the plaintiffs, by the parties, a question and answer format. So that was done. And then they came into town and were cross-examined for a day. And in the absence of any affidavit to the contrary, in the absence of any literature to the contrary, in the absence of anything other than the attorneys standing up and blatantly saying plaintiff's experts who are qualified are wrong, she granted summary judgment again. Judge Burkett in the Joyner case I was also referred to obviously would have said that that is improper. And I would suggest to you that Judge Han probably would have thought that was a good idea. Uh, I don't know the story but Judge Han before today, but I suspect he would have liked that. Unfortunately, what we lose sight of from time to time is that juries and people can make good decisions, that there is a need for cross-examination, as Justice Blackman said. The traditional way of attacking weak evidence is through cross-examination, and attorneys are trained to do that, and certainly those who appear on the sides of the drug companies and the manufacturers are usually pretty capable attorneys. I never did find a General Motors or a Ford or a drug company that couldn't afford a good attorney or two or three or four or 10 or 12 in one case. Um, so I would say that it is those of you who are out there advocating, and I suspect that there may be one or two or three people on my side in this room today, uh, but those of you that are out there advocating uh, that we uh, need to do more, such as Judge Han may have suggested. Uh, I would just say to you that you probably haven't tried too many cases. And you haven't seen the wisdom that exists in juries and in the jury system. And I would say to you, before you go too far supporting something like that, say to yourself, what if it were me? What if it were my child? Would I want that done? Would I want scientist to have a blue ribbon discussion about this? If you could find three scientists to have a panel who weren't somehow connected with that uh, situation or that issue, um, which I recall that I had a judge in Michigan uh, recently decided that she wanted to appoint some judges or some uh, a scientist. So she gave us a list of five scientists. We we're supposed to choose three. 
He couldn't find one on there that wasn't connected to the company in some fashion. Didn't stop her uh, anyway, because um, I had a chance to cross-examine him. But uh, uh, stop and think, what would I want? What kind of justice would I want if it were my child or my spouse or my father or my mother? Would you want Judge Hand's philosophy? Or would you want to rely upon attorneys to do their job as they're trained to do in a courtroom in front of the citizens of this country. Okay, uh, Dr. Ehrlich. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to keep to my three or five minutes. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult, obviously. So I'm not going to give you a chronology of the silicone breast implant issue at this point, and maybe it can come up later during the discussion. But some very important things were just said. And yes, as a parent or as a, as, as a potential litigant, I would want science to prevail because unlike what was said, uh, one side or another, science doesn't take sides. So true science has no sides. There's only true science, good science, and false science, pseudoscience, non-science. Uh, Sheila Birnbaum earlier spoke of the, in her early days, there was only carbon paper and all these other things weren't available. In my early days, when I was in medical school, we still used the textbook by William Boyd, a Canadian pathologist, in which he said, sometimes we don't have the answer. You'll just have to ascribe it to a visitation from God. And uh, that concept has gone out because you can't sue God. Somebody's got to be responsible. Somebody's got to be responsible and uh, when something goes wrong or when something happens after another event. So it, there's an awful lot of post hoc ergo propter hoc reasoning that goes on. And it reminds me, I think in currently this morning on, on the Today Show, they talked about the encephalitis mosquitoes in Rhode Island, about the strongest hurricanes uh, since the 40s, about the floods all over the place, a lot of natural events and a lot of disease. And it reminds me that in 1484, uh, Pope Innocent VIII uh, issued his um, papal bull, Sumus Desiderantes Affectibus, in which he legitimized the work of the plaintiff's attorneys of the time, Kramer and Spranger, who said that witchcraft was rife, and that's accounted for all the bad weather that they were having then, and all the plagues, such as the Black Plague, the uh, smallpox, the large pox, which we today know as syphilis, which were decimating Europe. And they went out on a witch hunt, which was legitimized. And they had a, uh, uh, they had a Marsha Angel in those days too. His name was Johann Weyer. And he said that most of the, that sure there was disease and sure, and he tried to explain some of it, and sure there were natural events, but a lot of what was going on was hysteria. And he uncovered this and wrote a book about it, which was immediately put on the proscribed list by the church. And the Kramer and Sprenger worked, and their successors worked and during the next hundred years, more than a million people in Germany who hadn't been killed by the diseases were executed uh, under horrible circumstances as prescribed in, the, in their book, Malleus Maleficorum, and uh, so this witch hunt went on without science because everything was blamed, everything that happened was blamed on something. And uh, the voices of reasons, which included incidentally, Dr. Johannes Faust, who was memorialized in operas and, and by Goethe and, uh, some, and Hans Sachs or Weiss the Singers and so forth. But that's another story. The fact is that we've been through all this before and science has been misused before. And um, in the, the symptoms and signs that have been attributed to silicone implants are now down to the symptoms and signs that in the 19th century, century were ascribed by a Dr. Erickson, a British physician, to uh, railways. He called it railway spine and he said people had cognitive impairment and poor concentration and sleep disturbances, anxiety, irritability, back stiffness and pain, joint pains, pain on movement, headaches, and loss of sexual desire. And people and the plaintiff's lawyers of the day made uh, 
sued on that basis, sued the railroads, and, and collected. Of course, that's gone out, and then neurasthenia came around at the turn of the century, and today we have the silicone breast syndrome, which, uh, because none of the diseases that were previously alleged turned out to occur in any excess, turns out to be a typical disease. A typical disease, of course, is undefinable, and the so-called experts who testified to it use circular reasoning to justify uh, what they have to say about it. Uh, so the problem comes up, whom, whom can you believe? Because in the courtroom, the plaintiff's attorneys are extremely persuasive. They, they often sound uh, a lot more credible than defense attorneys, at least uh, as, as one listens to them or as one reads the transcripts. But um, when they're experts, and there are very few physicians who are willing to testify to this so-called syndrome, their experts have paper credentials that compare favorably with those of the uh, defense experts. So how does one make a decision? Remember that science cannot prove a negative. Science can prove positives. It can prove an association. But the fact that something occurs after something else, whatever that X event is, has to be tested. You cannot always show that the one that just because something occurs after something, it occurs because of something. The negatives are extremely difficult to prove. And so that's why we have confidence limits and such, such other uh, statistical terms, which tell us that the chances are small, very small, that this is, uh, that this is a relationship. These small chances, then, uh, if every study comes out the same way, uh, then the chances are even smaller that there is a relationship. And when you're talking about an event that gets a lot of media attention or something like the Connie Chung show, which gave an un, uh, opposed view of the silicone breast implant as causing disease, if you get something like that, which scares people, they're going to remember. If I ask anybody in this room, what did you have for dinner last Thursday? Most of you will not remember what you had, but if it was your anniversary or some other event and you had a special dinner, you would remember. And that is exactly why epidemiology usually finds a slight increased risk for certain things it, when they check out things, because people do remember when, when they're primed to. They have more reason to remember. However, we don't even find that in most of the studies here. So the, the problem is, uh, comes down to innumeracy. Many of the physicians who truly believe what they say uh, are innumerate, as uh, innumeracy being the, the mathematical equivalent of illiteracy. They do not understand that the people that they see who are funneled to them in addition represent a specific population that is a numerator, and they don't know what the denominator is. They don't know how often something like this occurs in the general population. They, they only see these people in their offices. Uh, Berkson, the statistician that Mayo long ago defined this to the Mayo physicians who said, but some of these diseases supposedly rare appear to be very common. And they said, only in your practices because you're at Mayo Clinic. They wouldn't be common in the community at large. And that's what we're dealing with here. So far, no evidence has turned up to suggest that the silicone used in medical devices is immunogenic, that is, that it can cause immune reactions. And no evidence has turned up to show that it can cause any of the diseases alleged, especially since most of these diseases are no longer being claimed as being caused by it. And now we're up to this vague group of symptoms and signs that you that no one can verify. I'll stop here because I have lots more things to say, but there are other people to say things and maybe I'll get another chance. I'm sure that you will. Dr. Anderson. Um, I'm here uh, as a historian and I tore up my notes in the first panel this morning when I saw a history being revised by the Wall Street Journal and the attorney for Dow Corning. I want to take you back to the history and the interface of silicone regulation and the law. And I don't want you to think this is revision. I was a bit player in this drama. Now, to my mind, 
The silicone story began in the 1960s when an estimated 50,000 American women received illicit silicone liquid injections to augment their breasts. Their results were a disaster. The women developed inflammatory granulomas, the silicone extruded through holes in the breast, and it caused massive necrosis and scarring. The women who went on had breasts that felt like rocks. They faced amputation of their breasts. There wasn't, a, by the end of the 1970s, there was hardly a surgeon, in the, a plastic surgeon, in the United States who was not caring for some of these women. In the midst of this, the federal court indicted Dow Corning for misbranding, mislabeling, and transporting liquid silicone across state lines for the illicit injection into these women. A huge legal battle followed in 1970. Dow Corning pled nola contendra to eight counts, paid the grand total of $5,000 in fine. The issue then went on to a bag, a silicone envelope containing the same liquid silicone, which had been renamed and was used to swell the gel. Now, that liquid silicone bag was introduced and everybody was relieved. When it went into FDA review, it was grandfathered in because the device just did not exist when it first came on the market. It was given a privileged existence. When it came before the first FDA advisory panel, and I will talk later about the Dolbert being equal to an FDA advisory panel, which I've chaired. That panel was composed of plastic surgeons, and they recommended that the breast implants be approved as safe on the basis of data which was largely anecdotal. All that was needed was production standards. I chaired the same advisory panel in 1982-83. We were, we knew that liquid silicone could destroy the human breast. And the issue was, was the envelope containing the silicone. We knew that liquid silicone injections were illegal. We were surprised to learn, and I think chagrined to learn, that there was no data by the manufacturer or any of the plastic surgeons on the incidence of device failure, rupture, or bleed. There were a host of other problems, but the long-term outcome was unclear. My panel voted unanimously to keep these devices as class three, safety and efficacy not proven, and it begged the manufacturers, the FDA, and the plastic surgeons to make this the first priority for resolution. That agreement was made in the, in the meeting hall, and the gavel hit, it disintegrated. We then went on to the 1980s, and we began to have incidated cases showing up a product liability. Rupture with irretrievable silicone moving anywhere between the clavicle and the groin and they can't cut it out and these women being taken to court What we did know is that this went under court protective orders and nobody knew except the attorneys and the clients What was going on? We then had a build of more and more concerns about these devices some anecdotal stories case reports Which is how epidemiology begins you have to know what you're looking for on something called adjuvant disease or uh, autoimmune-like disease, but these were anecdotal. In 1988, I chaired that panel again. There was a public furor, but what shook me were two things. One is, in chairing that meeting, I had woman after woman stand and testify to the FDA that this happened to them with their breast implant, and they reported it to the manufacturer they went back to the manufacturer with their attorney, and there was no record of their K or their, their plea. No record. And the reason was, under existing uh, law and interpretation, the manufacturers were allowed to say whether any report was serious and whether it was related to the device, and it was their employees doing the screening. There was no data. 
The other part of that issue was when an attorney that you all know, Dan Bolton, stood up and said there are bad things happening with silicone. I can't tell you what it is because I'm under a court protective order. We knew that there had just been the Stearns versus Dow Corning, a multi-million dollar verdict, only a modest part for damage, the majority for punitive damages against the manufacturer. All right, we then go on to 1991. Now the, the manufacturers come in and they are supposed to present to the FDA the scientific data proving the safety and efficacy of silicone breast implants. 1963 to 1991, we looked at the material and it was clear even on preliminary review, it wouldn't pass muster. It would not stand up to critical review. But in that first session with the television cameras going, representatives of the manufacturers stood before boxes that they said contained new information about the safety and the science of breast implants, but they couldn't prevent it because there was a rule. You had to give your stuff to the FDA in advance so it could be reviewed and looked at. After they, a little Fiora wrote, I asked one of the FDA ministers to get that material. I wanted to review it. And I was told the boxes were empty. That was ballast. Now, I have nothing to answer that except that information has never been put forward by the manufacturer. And the question is, was that a nice charade? We then got into a chance luck or perhaps chance and bad luck. And that was Hopkins versus Dow Corning, another multi-million dollar suit alleging systemic illness. And the first time the FDA had access to court sealed documents provided by a reporter. That material carried information the FDA had never seen before. It wasn't the illness, it was scientific fraud. It was the misuse of human subjects in clinical research with implants that bled so much that they fell out of the womb. Ruptures appearing within three months of these devices appearing and there was liquid silicone or something very close coming out. And then all the stories you read in the press about you put it on velvet and it sweats and it bleeds. I'll not go on to all the other allegations, but that, was frightful. You then know that uh, we ultimately brought silicone breast implants into restricted use because their safety and efficacy was not shown. You know that the ATLA, the American Trial Lawyers Association, began using the standard approach, case incident, and began looking for people who had illnesses that had been Stern or Hopkins and began prorating these and built their entire settlement, giving the highest payments to replicas of those two medical cases. However, that same discovery led to something else that I want to read you. This is, this is too kind and gentle for me. This is the conclusion of an in-house advisory panel of the FDA reviewing scientific material presented to them by the multi-district litigation discovery group. The, the studies Dow Corning emitted from the PMA pre-market approval for their silicone gel-filled prosthesis do contain information significant to determine the safety and efficacy of breast implants. These studies in particular show toxicologic effects of silicone polymers that the manufacturers, including Dow Corning, have been saying cannot be produced in the animal model. The more salient question now was, was the withholding of this information an attempt to deceive? The content of the withheld documents can be said to show a pattern. Intelligent people familiar with this material and anxious to obtain agency approval would recognize that these studies would draw more inquiry and would justify further investigation into the safety of silicone devices. Mm -hmm. It is reasonable to assume 
that such people would not want this to happen. And being in a position to control the content of the pre-market approval application would leave these studies out to improve chances for FDA approval. This would be impossible to prove without internal documentation from Dow Corning clearly recording a conspiracy. If such documents ever did exist, they certainly do not exist now. Now, that was the FDA 1992. What went on then was Dow Corning purchasing research. I had a meeting uh, requested by Keith McKenna, the president of Dow Corning, where he brought his uh, medical officer and his epidemiologist. The meeting, meeting was really screening. He wanted to find out what I thought was going on, what the illnesses were. Also made it clear uh, that they were going to commit 20 to $30 million of research. And they were interested in resolving the questions in breast implants. In that meeting, I asked, I requested, I literally begged that that money be administered by a panel outside of Dow Corning, that it be impartial scientists deciding what issues are looked at. That was never done. What you see now and what has come out published in the New England Journal is highly selected research where money is being spent, $30 million for the defendants, nothing for the plaintiffs, doing the research. And now you're having a meeting today where you're talking about tort reform and you're raising criticism of scientific experts brought in by the plaintiffs. I'll not defend them, but I want to raise the question. $30 million selected research. What was left out? And why was it when they said there's no association with scleroderma? that nobody looked at what we wanted to see, the ruptures. I submit if those same studies from Mayo and from the Harvard Women's Group had looked at liquid silicone injection, they would have concluded there was no illness associated with liquid silicone injection. That was the way they were designed. Ending up, then, you face a dreadful situation my point is, how can any Dow Bear group, which doesn't do its own research, which is dependent on the manufacturer, or highly biased groups who select research and who sponsor it and do not sponsor conflicting views, how do you get science that any Dow Bear panel can effectively use fairly? I submit that regulatory intent by the FDA was defeated by the selective suppression and editing of scientific data. And the experts on my panel, I would stack up for any FDA, I mean, for any Dow Bear committee. Money, motive, you can call it good business, but I think it jeopardizes all the reform you talk about. If you're going to have reform, I want it on the other side of the bar as well as on the plaintiff side. Uh, Dr. Slauson. <coughs> Thank uh, Well, I may be one of the individuals who are a scientist who spends 98% of my time doing science and a small percentage of my time dealing with problems like this. And I think the difficulty as a scientist uh, is that the courts are being asked to, to deal with medical and scientific problems when in point of fact they're largely ill-equipped to deal with those problems. And perhaps I can give you uh, uh, my, a little bit of my own experience on, on this matter. Uh, over the years, I've developed many of the, uh, or many of the tests that are used to assess immunologic function in man. The CD4 test, for example, that is, deals with AIDS and the HIV, 
was developed in my laboratory many years ago and many of the others that have been used uh, by uh, plaintiffs, uh, attorneys, and experts to evaluate the immune response. Uh, these individuals over the years, and I've been asked to review data on, for example, uh, uh, toxic spills. I've been asked to review some of the data uh, on uh, the silicon breast implants. My experience is, is rather uh, distressing uh, uh, in the sense that I've looked at the data that has been generated using tests that I love, as I always point out that I sent uh, two children to college on the royalties of these tests, so to attack them has always been somewhat not the, uh, wise in, in a way. But you also don't like to see your children abused. And the tests are the children that I'm talking about. Uh, the difficulty of not only, for example, I, I'll give one example. In a recent toxic spill case, CD26, an antigen that I discovered in my laboratory, was purported to be abnormal in a very large population of individuals that were exposed to this toxic, uh, uh, supposedly a toxic spill. Uh, there were no objective clinical symptoms in this population. So there was no immunologist or internist who could go over these individuals and say, yes, they had their immunologic system compromised because they've had uh, a frequency of infections, they've had immunodeficiency, they've had uh, 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 susceptibility to a variety of uncommon infections, they have, they've had developed a higher incidence of cancer and a variety of these things. So we did not have very often a basic clinical syndrome that one could define. And I'll discuss the breast in, 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 a, in a few minutes. So in this case, we could not define. And much of the case rested on the use and misuse of a variety of clinical assays, which a jury was going to be asked to judge on their validity. The scientific literacy of juries is very low. I think if you'd ask most juries, is astrology a scientific area, they would say yes. And so to ask them to evaluate whether people who have 18% CD26 positive cells uh, would be very difficult in my mind. And whether or not, number one, having discovered the test, knowing that it has no diagnostic value, knowing that it has no predictive value in the development of the disease, to argue with individuals who are saying that it has a diagnostic value and a predictive value would be my word really against theirs. And I'm not sure the jury could always distinguish the credibility of someone who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences from one of the experts who happened to be practicing clinical ecology in Northern California. But that may <laughs> be the case. The point was, I was struck by the fact that I did not understand why the CD26 levels were high. And I accepted it as a scientist that the data was correct. The defendant's attorneys didn't want to repeat the tests. The plaintiff's attorneys only did the test once in a laboratory known to give them any result that they wanted. And so I did the silly thing was I asked to see the primary data. And there arrived two huge cartons, which were not ballast, but two huge cartons filled with data uh, that was, you know, I, I don't have the time, uh, but it was an intimidating uh, 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 task to go through it. And it turned out the CD26 numbers were fabricated. And I get a lot of things from attorneys. I can't even read the Xeroxes they send me. I mean, uh, the, the Xeroxes are poor, so I'm going to go read the methods in those papers. So the difficulty is, is how do you assess a variety of tests uh, uh, that are, are misused by purported reputable scientists? Uh, Mr. Nace indicated that if it were your child, okay, it's a terrible thing. 
Uh, I would say that many of these children in that community who are told that they had chemically induced AIDS are living with a terrible burden and fear that they may develop this terrible disease when in point the fact that there was no scientific data to deal with it, to prove their uh, point. The breast litigation, I think it's true that perhaps the, uh, 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 the companies did not do enough in the beginning, but the epidemiologic data indicate right now that there's no evidence of a disease. So they start with saying maybe it has a higher in frequency of cancer. They look, there's no increase in cancer. Then they say there's a higher frequency of scleroderma. They look, there's no increased incidence of scleroderma. Then they say uh, there's an increased incidence of lupus. There's no increased incidence of lupus. There's no increased incidence of mixed connective tissue disease. They said, well, the real problem is we have a symptom complex. And that's what they did to me with CD26. Not that I didn't understand CD26, but I didn't know CD26 plus CD4 plus CD56, the pattern that the experts on the plaintiffs see that most of us who are scientists don't see. So here we have a fair amount of epidemiologic data to say uh, 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 there's no evidence of disease in patients who've had breast implants. Here we have uh, uh, people who are not supported by uh, the drug companies who have looked at their seven or 800 patients with scleroderma to see if there's a higher incidence of disease. People who have done magnificent epidemiologic studies who have said there's no increased incidence of the disease. And to have what they've said uh, 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 denigrated by saying that they've received support from the drug companies is totally unfair. The second point is that when you look at some of the other tests that uh, 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 the plaintiff's uh, experts use, like uh, the response to silicon, antibodies to silicon, these are tests that are in these individuals' laboratories that haven't been replicated, that haven't been verified uh, in any other place. The other thing that occurs, in, in, in my estimation, is that We've asked people to do something like, well, if the test has been peer reviewed, then it has a certain level of validity. The difficulty is we didn't anticipate that they would start their own journals. And so, <laughs> uh, and those of us who do science really love to get a paper into cell, into nature, or into science. We even like to get papers into the New England Journal of Medicine. But they have journals that I can assure you nobody has even heard of, except the small group of individuals who make up the editorial board of these journals to make sure their friends are uh, 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 on these boards. So the concept of peer review and the concept that a jury can deal with these complex issues is really very difficult uh, for me to accept. So I really go back to the principle of, uh, uh, of having expert uh, uh, panels to help judges. They're not, and uh, lawyers. Uh, you know, my, I have a son who's a lawyer. He's the one who didn't like chemistry and science and blood. I have a son who's a physician who did like uh, uh, mathematics and the other things. So I, I don't think lawyers who even got a degree in chemistry maybe 20 years ago are not uh, technologically obsolescent in, in probably a week after they got their degree, as most of us are in the scientific community, unless we keep up. We're asking juries who are scientifically illiterate to deal with very complex issues. We're asking judges and lawyers who I also think to a large extent are scientifically illiterate to deal with very complicated issues. And I think we have in our society many groups, whether it is uh, the National Academy uh, of Medicine, the Institute of Medicine and their various groups, uh, groups who are associated with uh, 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 the American Association of Immunologists. I can consider large numbers of groups that could put together a panel of unbiased individuals who could help uh, 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 assess 
the validity of some of the scientific claims uh, that are presently uh, being made. Uh, thank you. Well, I, uh, is, this, is this working yet? I think it's fine. Okay, okay. Well, of course, I have a lot of opinions, and I, um, I had the same sort of funny feeling that um, Mr. Nace mentioned being in front of, a, I guess, a radical right-wing group, because uh, as soon as I got involved in this and some other stories, I all of a sudden became the darling of conservative groups, which is a very funny position for me. I, I never thought of myself as being aligned with one side or another, and it sort of indicated to me that how, how polarized people's opinions get and how much people want you to say what they think fits into their political view of things. I went at this as a science reporter, and I'm one of those people who does like science. I have a master's degree in mathematics, and I studied molecular biology in graduate school as well. So I, I like all this stuff, and I, and I consider myself quantitatively literate, which is the new catchword for people who, who like to look at this kind of thing. And yet, it was not, it was not an easy thing for me to, to um, report on. I first, I, I wasn't the report. I wasn't reporting on this in the beginning. At the times, I was somebody else was handling these stories, and and we we sort of stake out our own claims for things. And so it wasn't that somebody said, "Gina, don't do it." It's that I never said I particularly wanted to do it. I first became aware of some of the problems when I did a story on secrecy in the courts, on orders, court orders that would seal information that you might want to know. And I wrote a, a, a story on this, which was a page one story, and I, and I spoke to Dan Bolton, and he said, you know, we have this, this, this judgment here. We have, I guess it was the Maria Stern case, and we have this, this, this incredible damning evidence that Dow Corning knew and knows how dangerous breast implants are, and they willfully hid their material from the FDA, and I can't tell you what I know because of a secrecy order. And that sort of stuck with me. I thought, okay, well, what we have going for us so far is anecdotal evidence. And as a, science, a quantitatively literate science reporter, I am really skeptical of anecdotal evidence. I saw it in the Ben Decton case, and I was skeptical then. And I was skeptical when I saw people coming forward saying, I have scleroderma, and I had breast implants, and therefore the breast implants cause the scleroderma. I mean, you could say, I drank coffee this morning, and I have scleroderma. The coffee caused the scleroderma. You really can't just draw that kind of a conclusion. And I think most of us who've been in this business for a while learn not to to jump to those conclusions so quickly ourselves and so I was I was not persuaded by the anecdotes but I was really you know I just had this doubt in my mind when I heard there's these secret, these secret data that were provided to the FDA and not provided to the FDA <laughs> that were in the hands of Dow Corning and the FDA didn't have them and I and then the the scientific evidence started coming out and nothing seemed to be support the epidemiology did not seem to be supporting what the plaintiff's attorney said and yet i still kept thinking there might be another piece of this picture there's some data that we don't have there's this secret data and the fda saw it and and they asked the justice department to look into this thing and whatever came of this i think it was it was years later before i found out what came of it it was very strange dow corning told me what came of it and then they supplied me with information and i and i checked with the fda just to be sure it turned out that during um i think it was uh, during the multi-district litigation they were going through some storeroom with all sorts of documents and they came upon something from the fda which and the justice and it said um <laughs> We looked at all the stuff that Dow Corning didn't give us, and we decided that there was nothing there that wasn't also in the information that they did give us. And in fact, you could reasonably argue the information they did not give us was of, of a lesser quality, but generally supportive of the information it did give us. So it made sense for them not to have necessarily provided us with this. It wasn't like anything was hidden. There was nothing new there. It was just stuff that was of, of not as high scientific quality. I said, boy, now this is not amazing. They hadn't told Dow Corning. They never mentioned it to anybody. It just sort of went away. The and I called the FDA and I said, I have this document. Is it is it for real? I mean, maybe this is somebody's interim report and somebody else came by later and said, hey, guess what? Um, this interim report is wrong. There was something here. They said, no, that's our final report. 
And the Justice Department had contacted Dow Corning and said, we are dropping our case, and they never comment on anything else. So, so as far as we know, there wasn't this. But as a reporter, this really did place a doubt in my mind. On the other hand, the epidemiology never, never showed, you, showed anything. And there's always the question of, well, do you want to trust these studies? One of the studies that was, was, was under a real cloud of suspicion was one by Charlie Hennikins at Harvard. He told me the story behind his study. What happened was Dow Corning was asked by the FDA to conduct some studies, and it had to put some money into this thing. And he said, gee, I have the perfect population. I have some data. We can look back at my study population and ask some of these questions, and we probably can get these data in an unbiased way because these women were part of a different study and they were filling out questionnaires, and it was not specifically a study asking them, do you have breast implants and do you feel tired today or do you have a headache or something? So he, um, he went to David Kessler, the head of the FDA, and said, I have a problem. I want to do this study. But if I do it and Dow Corning pays for it, how can I make sure that, that, nobody, that, they can't, that nobody can ever claim this study was tainted? What can I do to maintain my scientific integrity and yet take this money, which is so readily available, to look at this population, which I already have, and get some answers? And he and David Kessler decided that probably the best thing to do was to get in writing something from Dow Corning saying they were going to give him the money and they were not going to know anything about it from then on. He could say what he wanted, he could publish what he wanted, they would not even know what he said until he decided to tell them. So that's what he did. And when the study came out, we ha there were claims that you cannot believe it because it was paid for by Dow Corning. It didn't show what the plaintiff's attorneys had hoped it would show. It, it was one, another one of those studies that didn't show much. Now, when I wanted to report on this as, as a reporter, and this comes back to the central question of can you find independent scientific experts, I thought I had this, this problem that I had all the time in the breast implant stories, and that was if you, everybody that cared about the data was, seemed to be associated with one side or another. They were a consultant, they were an expert witness, they were something. And so when you do a story and you say, Dr. So-and-so, who is a consultant for Dow Corning, said he thinks there's nothing there, or she thinks there's nothing there, then people will discount it immediately. Or you say, Dr. So-and-so, who is an expert witness for the plaintiffs, <clears throat> it's discounted immediately. So how do you find these independent people? Well, it's not that diff it's, it's not simple, but it's not impossible either. I found when I was reporting on, um, on doctors who had, who had set up deals with lawyers, I thought that we're, we're sort of running women through these mills and coming out with the disease they wanted to find and, and the treatment they wanted to give. I found doctors who were, who were specialists in those diseases, who had had nothing to do with the breast implant litigation, who were more than willing to discuss with me what was going on and to give some very strong statements saying this is outrageous, this is, this, is, you know, this is not medicine, this is not the way things should go. So I didn't have a lot of trouble finding people who were, who, first of all, people, people said I don't know if I should even get into this because if I do, I'll get drawn into the litigation. Someone's going to want me for an expert witness. But they felt so strongly about what they were seeing that they decided they would talk about it anyway. And these were people who were very credible people who had, who had very good scientific reputations and were not making any money on this. And then when I wanted to um, write about Charlie Hennigan's story, I thought, what's the best way to do this? And I decided I better find some epidemiologists who had a lot of experience evaluating large studies like this, who had never had anything to do with the breast implant litigation, litigation who had never made any money from it, who had not consulted for anybody and didn't want to, and ask them if they would look at this and tell me what did they think. And, that, and I found several people with, it, it was not like a month long reporting thing. I'm talking about a day or so. It was not impossible. So I think that I, I, I agree that it's just as my own experience and getting the kind of responses I get when I write stories, I think it's difficult to find lay people who can understand these complexities. I think that we're talking about a way of reasoning that mo many people don't have. I think that most people don't do not, have not been taught and are not used to thinking the way that scientists think and they're not used to evaluating evidence. But I don't think it's that difficult to find scientists and I think, and I agree that we have some bodies like the National Research Council and that can help us to find independent experts who can 
objectively look at information and ask and answer the question, is there anything here that you would, that, or, or are these anec unsubstantiated anecdotes or are we using tests that are not validated by anybody and or primary data that are just untenable on the face of it? And I think that that might help stop the kind of situation that we had with Bendectin with breast implants. It is the nature of science if such a thing exists that it doesn't care who it helps or hurts. The, Whoever wrote the laws of science uh, was sort of indifferent to uh, human outcomes and social outcomes. Um, but there is one glaring exception. First, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the, the first point of somebody actually mentioned my name in the previous panel in, in connection with tobacco, which incidentally illustrates how readily some plaintiff's lawyers will appoint experts. Um, I've written one Forbes column on the economics of tobacco and appeared twice on television having written that column, and that made me the leading uh, expert on this issue. But let us talk tobacco. Uh, there are three facts which I am really quite confident about in the tobacco context, and I, I have to say I really I can't take them personally. I can't get angry about them. I couldn't care less if anybody believes them or not. I just so firmly believe them to be true. One is that tobacco companies sold cigarettes in Mississippi. The second is that those sales caused a lot of premature death in Mississippi. And a third is that that saved the state of Mississippi money. And I, you know, who cares uh, whether you wish to believe it or whether you wish to believe it or not, or whether you <laughs> wish to appoint me the angel of darkness. I couldn't care less. They all happen to be true facts. Notice that. Um, to two thirds of the facts asserted there are in, are are contested by different camps of lawyers. The, the tobacco companies, or at least some of them, and their lawyers would still like to suggest that tobacco did not, in fact, cause premature death. And the plaintiffs' lawyers would like to suggest that the economics play out in some bizarre way, which is is equally uh, untrue. And uh, once again, I, this I truly wish both sides could lose. They both deserve to. And. and <laughs> You know, it's, we've just hired two packs of liars to go after each other. It really come, comes down to that. Um, uh, uh, and, and they're lying about facts. And you know, uh, um, This is not, the, by any means, the only instance. Uh, you know, the Daubert was the big junk science case that went up to the Supreme Court. And I was very interested in that case and followed it. I enjoyed following it. Um, one of the amicus briefs in that case, and everybody, of course, was hiring left and right. One of the amicus brief, briefs uh, in that case was filed by somebody who, politics aside, I enormously admire and like, although I don't know, know him personally. He was one of the signatories, and that's Stephen Jay Gold, who's a paleontologist at Harvard. Many of you will have read his columns or his marvelous books, Panda's Thumb, and so on. And Stephen Jay Gold was actually uh, retained by the plaintiff's uh, side in this, and he was signing a brief which generally argued for lenient standards of scientific admission and, and uh, saying that you know you cannot draw firm lines or you can, absolute lines, crisp lines between good science and junk or so and so on. And this is the man who in his other life and for which he's earned my enormous respect, I don't know about the rest of you, mm -hmm. has spent his life saying, look, in schools across the country we should be teaching the real kind of science, Darwinian science, and not creation science. He believes that firmly in his own field, uh, but when it comes to litigating birth defects, suddenly we have no lines between good science and bad. Uh, the, if, if you believe Stephen Jay Gold in that context, what could possibly be wrong with the state of Mississippi legislating say that uh, we should teach only creation science in Mississippi and not Darwinian science. After all, if there are no lines, if you're at one expert's as good as the next here, if anybody we hire is as believable as anybody else, how could that possibly be an establishment of religion? There is no difference between religion and science if you believe that line of argument. In fact, there's no such thing as science at all. I mean, there are creation scientists out there. They probably even have a peer-reviewed journal, for all I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, let us continue this. Uh, uh, many, many of you, many of you uh, know that before Daubert, the sort of standard um, uh, sort of reference in, for federal courts in, in, on, on standards of scientific evidence was a case called Fry. Uh, I wonder how many of you remember what Fry was about. It was about a lie detector. And I wonder how many of you remember which side of the case in Fry had submitted the lie detector evidence that got excluded. Was it the, was it the prosecutor or was it the defendant? I won't, I won't tell you if you don't know. Go look it up. But I tell you, it was only one side, and, and which should tell you, you know, which, which is the politically fair or, or, or correct way to call it. I mean, either lie detectors are, are, are good and reliable evidence or they're not. Uh, and it shouldn't matter, you know, whether that was a prosecutor submitting it or a defendant. The same with DNA evidence. We said the spectacle of Barry Sheck in a recent well-publicized trial talking a lot about uh, DNA evidence. Now, DNA evidence is either reliable or it's not. 
Uh, but whether it is or not, it, sh it should, uh, if it is, it is equally reliable when it is submitted by somebody who's been in prison for 10 years on a rape murder charge and you find out that the semen doesn't match, as has happened repeatedly in the last few years, in which case, for somebody like me who thinks it is reliable, I would say we get that man out of prison right away and pay him some abundant compensation for the horrible wrong we've done him, okay? Or, or it's reliable when we're putting somebody on death row uh, uh, for on the same strength of the evidence. It's politically neutral, but the stuff's either good or it's bad. It's not just good when you want it to be and, and, and bad uh, uh, when, you, when you don't want it to be. Um, uh, I, the Supreme Court, before it took the Daubert case, had the uh, case about Dr. Death, who's a psychiatrist who travels in southern courts, uh, testifying about the future dangerousness of, uh, of, of capital, uh, capital defendants. And, and, and uh, future dangerousness is a factor that is weighed in, in capital sentencing. Now, if you believe in that kind of psychiatry and, and think it's accurate, then it perhaps should be admissible. States, many states have written laws saying that future dangerousness is relevant. And if you think it's absolutely unmitigated junk, which in fact it is, then that man should, <laughs> then that man should not be in testifying in court. And it is an abomination whether that, to, that he's even admitted into court. And it is, it is an abomination even when he's admitted in court to send Ted Bundy to the electric chair. Ted Bundy deserves to go, but not on the strength of, of, of Dr. Death's testimony. I mean, that's, this is just a matter of good sanitation in court, and we, should, we, and, and, and we should accept that. And finally, you know, it's rare that I agree with, with, with Mr. Nace, but I'm happy to today. I have three children, and I have their interests very much at heart. Um, and I cannot possibly believe, that, you know, in answer to Mr. Nace's question, that anybody, any parent of children actually believes that their children will be better off in a society that just lets, uh, you know, junk science uh, proliferate all over the place. I guarantee you the only place they are better off is when they are in court with a weak case as plaintiffs. Then they are much better off, <laughs> or when they are in court with a bad case as defendants. Uh, either way, if, you, if, you are, if the facts are against you, then you are in favor of junk science. But if, if, if my child has cancer and I'm suing, I might well want ju uh, ju junk science. But if my, cancer, if my child has cancer and I'm trying to get her treated, I want, I want the Mayo Clinic. I mean, that's, that's just the way it goes. And all of us would make that same call. You shouldn't be, the, 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 it is a completely artificial situation to say, oh, I want it when Mr. Nace is representing me. Yes, you do want it when he's representing you, but that's not, the, not how we can make general rules. That, that's only half the picture, which brings me to my last point. Um, if you believe in facts and science and so on, you, this leads you to a certain kind of ordered view of society. There is one community, however, that is unconditionally favored by looser standards of evidence and bad science, and that is the legal community. I don't mean just the plaintiff's lawyers. I don't mean just ATLA. I mean completely symmetrically, plaintiffs and defense lawyers alike, because the more uncertainty there is, the more we can pretend that known facts are not known, the more we can send them at each other and let them fight out things at enormous expense in court. And you will find quite as many defense lawyers they can't do it quite so openly because their clients hang over them, but quite as many of them resisting the notion that we should strengthen uh, standards of scientific evidence as those who are pushing in the other direction on, from the other side. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair to, to, to ask one question, and in a sense it's the question that, that I really I began with, uh, and it, it is this. Uh, if... Uh, we accept, as I do, I think, logically that Judge Hand is right, that a rule that tries to say this comes in, this doesn't come in, this does, doesn't, based on some Fry or Daubert standard is illogical and inconsistent with the view that the jury, uh, rather than the witnesses, ought to be addressing the ultimate issues, ought to be addressing the uh, uh, grand and general premises. Then it seems to me the question that I tried to pose initially is nonetheless uh, still a question. And that is, is there a way to get good science uh, into a decisional uh, uh, status uh, in litigation? Now, let me say that, that um, it may very well be that because uh, witnesses for the plaintiffs and the witnesses for the defendants appear to be each uh, carrying his or own, her own biases does not mean that all scientists are liars or that all scientists are dishonest. That seems to me that's an example of the very innumeracy that we are talking about. And my hypothesis would be that, that the scientific community in general subscribes to what Peter Huber just said, and that is that science is apolitical. 
that there really is uh, uh, scientific truth, yay or nay. And so the question, it seems to me, is, is that accessible uh, in the judicial process? Now, I would also say, hypothetically, if it's accessible to Gina Colada, it seems to me it ought to be accessible to, to uh, federal judges or state judges if they choose uh, to attempt to find it, which seems to me fundamentally to be the question, will they attempt to find it? And so the question, and this is the kind of questions that lawyers and judges of good faith have to address is, is there a mechanism that will permit them to find it? Uh, in a fashion which is appropriate and is reviewable. I'd like at least the scientists here to tell me if they think that Peter Huber is right, that there is something about truth of science, and if Gina Colada is right, that there is a community, and maybe it's 98% of the scientific community, that would like to wash its hands of the courtroom, but not of science, and would, if asked to participate in a way that was consistent with their own uh, self-image and principles uh, to aid, to provide aid in this process, would they do it? And I'd like at least the three scientists and Barry, perhaps, to uh, just just briefly comment on whether you think those premises have any validity. Sure. Yes, I think that uh, there is some validity. I think that uh, we can and should vet the kind of science, or if we don't, we, I don't think that the committee, that um, outsiders necessarily need to judge the facts of the case, but they should judge the validity of the kind of testimony and the, and the validity of the kind of evidence that's being uh, brought to bear, and also the, val the validity of the people who are going to do this testimony. Now. Um, in the case we've been discussing at some length, the, the, the silicon implant issues, I must take some issue with what Dr. Anderson told you, because uh, Elizabeth Connell, who was the chairman of the, of the advisory committee in, the, in this last instance, uh, has told me that, uh, there were, that there are serious distortions here uh, uh, of what was presented to the committee and the decision that came about, that this is not how the committee felt as a whole. That there was no, that there was nothing that was hidden from the committee. That there are no secret documents. That the sarcomas that were found in the animals uh, are inherent in that particular species and have never been duplicated in man. And that there is no in increase. I also know that there are more than a hundred thousand different kinds of silicone. That the contents of the of the envelopes in the silicone breast implants changed several times during the manufacture by various manufacturers, so there is no single compound, and that this so-called adjuvant disease, which was originally reported in Japan, by the way, not in the United States, where the injections of silicone were accompanied by paraffin and some other substances to produce this uh, horrible disease in some of the women, when that is, inter when that is extrapolated to breast implants, I'm reminded of, of uh, Stepard's uh, play the real thing where one of the characters says it's it's scary to find stupidity made coherent. Uh, I think that uh, th you, you cannot do that. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that the, that the that the device that the kinds of silicone used in devices not just in breast implants but in joints for other purposes in the body for leads for pacemakers and for, for various other things that are absolutely essential, such as shunts and so forth, is in any way immunogenic or causes any of the diseases. Uh, and there are no longer any diseases being alleged. It's just a vague group of symptoms, none of which can be uh, verified and uh, suspect tests. Dr. Anderson, uh, I know you're going to want to respond, but I, no, I wonder if not, you could, not to that. But I, but I wonder if you you would would try to address very briefly just my point, which is, is there, you know what it is, but I'll let you address it. Uh, anybody who has worked in this arena believes in science, believes that this is the only way we'll have effective, fair, and rational decisions. Uh, I believe in the FDA. I believe in regulation, and I think the FDA has to have full access to all relevant material to make appropriate and fair decisions. The problem is when that data is edited, suppressed, 
or delayed. You can make, with the best panel, the wrong scientific decision. So one has the ideal premise that's been put forward with Dobert, that in a real world, yes, we can identify science and we can go through in a very critical manner, we can resolve these questions. I uh, would like to remind you again, not only that that Dobert panel doesn't generate the data, what kind of data is being given to it? I've not said that the, for example, the epidemiology on silicone, on scleroderma, et cetera, is wrong. I said, what didn't they look at? And what they have been ignored in this is uh, reports that these devices rupture anywhere between five and 50% of the time after they've been in the body for 10 years. Now, the, the thing that stands out looking at peer review, let's go through the history. Let's not talk what you think in the golden rule. The history of peer review for silicone breast implants. 90% of all the literature up until 1991 came from plastic surgeons and representatives of the silicone manufacturers. If you were going to use publication for expertise, it would come from vested interests. You would see virtually all of the publications about breast implants was not in the New England Journal. It was in the Specialty Society Plastic Surgery Journals. And in the days of alleged injury, the, there was, the plastic surgeons denied that silicone could destroy the breast. The editors added in press, this destruction of the breast is not due to silicone, it's due to this adulterance of the Sakurai effect. It took them 20 years to admit that wasn't true. The editors added it in press. You can go through and look at the history of what I'm worried about and what my panel was worried about, rupture. A review of silicone breast implants in 1988 reported 40 cases of rupture. When we had a, a single surgeon report in 1991, one experience, 91 cases. And what came out of this when we talked with others was that no one published bad results. Records weren't kept. No one wanted to publish bad results. When you have that, how do you find the truth? And I think you now you want good science. You have to know the problems in advance. You want objectivity. I also want to walk through and tell you that uh, these decisions are not made in the abstract. Uh, the plastic surgeon who first raised the sword against what was going on in Las Vegas and the women getting silicone injection, literally had his practice destroyed, his referral base taken away as he was disciplined for making this stance. Uh, one of the members of my FDA advisory committee who voted to say they would keep these at class three was threatened uh, with his professional career, never returned again for an FDA advisory panel. The second in command of the Canadian FDA uh, was critical of the polyurethane coated breast implants and was fired. Uh, we can go on and talk about other kinds of discipline that are brought uh, even more currently by professional societies and in this highly charged arena with these kind of pressures, it's one thing to talk about idealism, but trench warfare can be very dirty. Dr. Slossman, I wonder if you could just have a brief comment or two, and then Barry, well, you, I would be interested in your views too. I, I, we've heard of a conspiratorial approach. I, I think the fundamental issue is that we really can't go back and look at what was to be done. I think if you look at the point of view of the breast manufacturers, they didn't do epidemiologic studies. Now that they've supported some, it's bad that they've supported them. So you can't have it both ways. On the other hand, what we have to deal with is the individuals who come into the courts and represent themselves as experts, who are not really experts, who who ask the courts to evaluate tests that are not well established, not. Uh, recognized by the FDA, not recognized for the purposes which they use the tests, and these tests being used to support the notion that silicone on one hand or this toxic substance produce some terrible effect on, on the plaintiffs. How 
to go about evaluating those tests when many of them have been published in uh, journals that are not available to the rest of the immunologic community and really have not re received true peer review of, of scientists in that field. And I think for that purpose, you need some form of an expert uh, 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 a panel or group. And I think, uh, uh, as Gina Collada indicated, the, uh, uh, the Medical Research Council, which is a part of the National Academy of Sciences and supported by the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy, has can convene panels. And there are uh, reputable scientists who don't sell out to the, to the companies. And I could assure you that when grants come into universities from uh, these companies, and I, I, don't, I don't have a grant from Dow or anything mm -hmm. else, and that's not me yet. That, that's, a, that's an insult. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that's an insult. Uh, uh, number one, there are institutional uh, uh, overseeing that, that, uh, that if a company supported research, and 20% of research in this country is supported by uh, 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 a variety of pharmaceutical companies and other companies, a vast majority is still supported by National Institutes of Health. But the uh, rules and uh, regulations that involve uh, 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 pharmaceutical industry support are very great, and they prevent, uh, as the case was with Dr. Hennekins in the School of Public Health, that A, Dow Corning didn't see the data before uh, it was ready for publication, or even after it was published, and they had no uh, av uh, ability to influence the data. And I think that's the case in 99.9% in .9 of, of the universities in this country that accept pharmaceutical industry uh, support, which has been a, a valuable way to support research in the country. Very well, let me start off by saying, because uh, Stephen Jay Gould is somebody that I don't know, never met, never talked to, never had anything to do with him. I did represent the plaintiffs in the Daubert case, and I can assure you, he was not retained, hired, or anything else by any plaintiffs uh, in that case. So I don't, I don't even remember exactly the truth, to tell you the truth. Uh, the, uh, we hear a lot of this rhetoric uh, going around, but uh, you know, it still comes down to the point that I'm not willing to accept everything that you say, doctor. I'm not willing to accept everything that these people say. And maybe my clients aren't either. And I think we feel a lot more comfortable if we could get you under cross-examination and ask questions. And then the people could decide what weight, what credibility they want to give to you. So I do not, uh, and I'm not picking on you, I'm just no, that's uh, fine. as an example. <laughs> This guy never met you before, I don't know you. And contrary to everybody else in this room, I don't do breast implant cases. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, it's very interesting though, listening to it. But uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, we, I would disagree with these blue ribbon panels. We don't need blue ribbon panels. We need attorneys who can properly know the subject and cross-examine these people. And if they're so bad, and as I hear, some of these experts are so bad. I am absolutely convinced that those good attorneys uh, can cross-examine the hell out of them and show how bad they are to the point that their testimony is either going to be stricken or it's going to be totally disregarded. So it, it comes down to the fact that it's I would much sense. rather rely on someone making a decision yeah. after they've heard all the evidence and all the testimony who is a citizen of this country and some blue ribbon elitist group deciding what they want should be the evidence. Thank you. How, how, how about some any questions from the floor? Yeah. First of all, you do respect the viewer. I find it incredible that you would come here on a panel to talk about junk science. When your books have been filled, uh, mistreatment of court cases and the famous three hundred billion dollar cost of the tort system, which was dissected in four law review articles and has been taken from a magazine of a quote by a CEO who said it cost eight billion dollars and you used all these fudge factors to get up to three hundred billion dollars. The insurance industry now says it's one hundred and fifty billion dollars and it's twenty five percent of the administrative cost. So I'd like to talk a little bit, as Barry May said, about junk scholarship and who pays for that. And to follow up on that, I'd like you to name one case, with the exception of breast complaint, one case where a plaintiff is won 
where you think the science has been junk and has not been overturned on appeal where the award has been reduced. And not the CAT scan case, which you disputed in your book, or any other. Name one case where you can do this. Well, one last I checked, which was, I admit, about uh, six or eight months ago, I believe Mr. Nay still had one Bendectin case alive, possibly two. Um, with, uh, have you lost both those now, Mr. Nay? No, I haven't. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I might also add that I'm sure you've made a lot more money on Bendectin than I have, Mr. Huber. Uh, <laughs> um, most of the others have been lost. So uh, as for the case, as for the $300 billion, if you if you wish to take $150 billion in direct costs, which is twice the $80 billion in direct costs that I cited when I wrote my book uh, eight years ago, I think uh, the direct costs are about $150 billion today. The indirect costs, I think, are at least the same. or we'll double that again. So if I had to put a number on the table today, it would be not $300 billion, but probably about $450 billion. Do you think, that, do you yeah. think the $300 billion was obtained by junk science? It was the Tillinghast study, and I was quite clear. The Tillinghast. Uh, no, that's not. Valid. No, that's. A, it was billion dollars no, that's. No, no. The factor to get the administrative cost. No, this. Not the Tillinghast. Uh, Tillinghast has always been on. That, the, no, no, that's not true. The Tillinghast study in 1987 was 80 billion. Two years before that, it was 60 billion. Two years before that, it was 45 billion. I urge you to read it. Okay. I, I think maybe <laughs> the two of you can sort this one out. Uh, uh, you're just, you're just wrong, at, sir. You just lunch. made up your numbers. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to ask a very specific question, which I think is along the lines of what Mr. Warren has been trying to get at. And I'll ask Dr. Anderson because of his expressed faith in the FDA. If the FDA finds a product to be safe and effective, which it has to do by statute, and if the company has committed no fraud, would you su support a rule of law which precludes any court or any jury from finding that product to be dangerous and defective? Uh, I'd like to answer that in the affirmative, but I can't begin because of the realities of practical experience. And the limitations here are the data, again, the FDA doesn't do science. It, it's at the mercy of what's given. Second, it's long-term follow-up. How accurate, how good is it? And the ultimate testing is in the marketplace and outcome. So the FDA is not fallible. It is not infallible. It is very fallible. And I think one of the arguments for product liability is because of the fact that the regulatory agency is subject to a great deal of political pressures. Uh, I've watched Congress, uh, I've watched the executive influence the direction of an FDA investigations. So the answer is that the regulatory agency is not run on hard science. It's politically sensitive, and I think we have a, a reason then for not making it infallible in the, law, the view of the law. I think you know what my answer is. Uh, well, I didn't ask you. Yeah, oh, I thought you asked me. <laughs> but let me, let me uh, also, I thought you were talking to me also, but you know, when the very first Bendectin case that I tried, there was a, a very, everybody in this area would agree with me, an extremely conservative trial judge handling the case. And defense counsel got up and said, hey, the drug's been approved. It's on the market. The FDA said it's OK. And this extremely conservative judge looked at them and he said, pointing to the jury boxes, there is your FDA. I would much rather rely on those people to decide again based on what I've learned from the FDA over the years and what I've seen. There's a, there's a consequence of this that I don't know if you've addressed yet or not. But uh, I know uh, when I was looking through the old records of one of my former law firms, they used to get trials in 60 and 90 days after serving the complaint. <laughs> and that was in the 1890s, of course. But uh, we had a couple of experiments in New York. One of them was called medical malpractice panels. <laughs> Another one was called um, something like uh, mandatory conciliation. And. Uh, what we've got wrong in the civil justice system today is complexity, not excessive simplicity. And what are the unintended effects of turning two lawyers loose on this one additional panel before you even impanel your jury uh, to allow the insurance companies to hold the money a few more months uh, while they abuse uh, this additional step before they get to the real thing? Yeah, let, let me say, um, as Learned Hand said, these are issues that will be worked out different ways in different times in different places. But the principle, I think, that he was advocating nonetheless has much to recommend it. 
if it is true that we allow uh, expert witnesses to testify to opinion because those are general premises which are outside the ken of normal jurors, then it follows logically that jurors who do not have that specialized expertise cannot decide between two experts who say competing things. So that leads logically, I think, to the conclusion that those issues need to be, in the first instance, resolved uh, by someone who can make those kinds of judgments. And that general uh, uh, knowledge needs to be to convey to the jury in a form that it can be used in a trial. Now, I would anticipate and, uh, that, in fact, if there are, and which I believe my hypothesis at least is that there are, uh, unbiased scientists, most of whom have nothing to do with the courtroom and don't want to have anything to do with the courtroom, but perhaps could be persuaded to play a role if their uh, principles and discipline were accepted. I suspect that those individuals, in truth, would find a lot of the cross-examination by both sides in these cases is hogwash and a waste of time. What they would want to do, I suspect, is, as Dr. Slossman suggested, they might very well want to say, let me see your underlying data or let me address uh, how you got to the conclusions that you propose to testify to in this case. I don't say these things are easy. I think the system is exceedingly uh, complex. Uh, I do think there's an important role for lawyers, even under a system like that, but I suspect it's quite a bit different than the role that the lawyers would be playing today. Uh, you do have to, I think, pose questions which are of concrete value in a case. You simply can't let this be an open-ended process. Lawyers, can, lawyers are good at this. Judges are good at this. Uh, this is analogous to the process, what I'm suggesting, analogous to the process uh, that is employed when lawyers suggest uh, alternative charges to a jury on questions of law. There are certainly differences of point of view, but it does, it seems to me, become very clear what the disputed issues of law are for the judge to decide. Those questions need to be posed to persons of expertise who have the ability to address them uh, in, in a, a manner that will provide general and usable advice to the jury. Let me just say again, I, I don't want to be a great big advocate for this in, in the sense of I think it, uh, there are immense complexities and you have to take things a step at a time and go uh, slow. I only suggest that logically it has advantages over the present uh, system, as Ju Judge Hand said. And I do believe, as Ms. Collada said, that we have uh, scientific organizations of real merit in this country, the National Research Council, Council, the National Academy of Sciences, and many professional organizations and boards. I think they are dubitanti about uh, their role in this process, but I think uh, persons of good faith and judges of good intent uh, could approach them uh, uh, and would, I believe, be able to persuade them uh, uh, to participate in experiments along the lines that we're talking about. So no speeches on it, but it seems to me logically there's much to be said for that point of view.